begin her presentation. Great. Uh, thank you so much to Montre and team and Liz for seeing us through. It's been actually many years now since we started this project and many different changes along the way. So thank you so much for your patience. Um, so um, I'll just do a quick introduction of the team. It, uh, so the research team um, was at UC Berkeley. And uh, so it consists of me, um, Rini Roy Elias, who is a consultant actually, but a, a PhD graduate from UC Berkeley. Um, Julia Greenberg, who will uh, co-present with me today, um, who is our research manager at the Urban Displacement Project. And Alex Romeller, uh, a PhD student who couldn't join us today, um, but uh, was really a, a workhorse on this project. Um, I, well, I'll be mentioning our partners later on. I didn't see them uh, in the group, but if any of them are here, um, please uh, let us know. Um, our, par pro our partners from Public Advocates, Public Council, Leadership Council, um, and CHPC, um, were, and I'll talk about them in a second, fabulous uh, partners on this project. Um, I'm gonna jump in then, if, uh, um, our partners are not here. So the goals of this project um, were really to, to think about the California portfolio of climate investments, whatever we could find really in terms of that portfolio. Um, that portfolio, as you know, is very important to reduce greenhouse gas uh, emissions, but we were concerned that it could also have unintended consequences, specifically by increasing household mobility out, out migration among uh, low-income renters in particular. So we set out to measure this impact, to quantify it for the first time. Um, that was really our primary research question. And then we worked to develop a tool um, to, to really uh, visualize the relationship between investment and displacement. And then uh, thirdly, we, we set out to craft policy recommendations um, and thinking about different types of contexts, different investments, different types of neighborhoods. And to advise those, we worked uh, with our community partners on a series of case studies, which Julia will talk about uh, presently. So there's three components here to the, to the study that we'll be talking about today. Um, there's the descriptive and, and regression statistical analysis of uh, the investments and their impact, the, the case studies and the tool. Our partners, um, as I mentioned, um, came from across the state and in the three regions that we studied, the Bay Area, uh, in the Bay Area actually extending to Sacramento, so the greater uh, Bay Area, um, and then Fresno, um, and then LA, LA County. Um, and I can't say enough about these uh, partners. Um, it, they were, you could not ask for better partners. Um, right from the beginning, when they helped us conceptualize the research design, um, when they, they continued to meet with us for the first year as we had innumerable data problems, innumerable research design problems, and they wrestled with us and helped us find a way through. Um, and then um, they worked with us on case studies um, really quite directly. I mean, they co-authored them essentially. Um, they did, uh, they, they connected us to many different stakeholders and, um, and then they, uh, they, they really made sure that we came to the right conclusion. So, so these were really co-creators of our study. So I'm gonna talk about the quantitative findings first. Um, in terms of data, so we, we used um, a unique um, data set to measure household mobility. And so for many years, a lot of our research relied on ACS, American Community Survey data at the neighborhood level. And that data has, uh, is, is a little problematic for studying individual household mobility outcomes. It's very hard uh, to, to, 
to parse out what the experience of individual households out of that neighborhood data. So we've moved in actually all of our studies to this individual household data as a proprietary data set uh, call, uh, called InfoGroup. It's been renamed to Data Axel. And this data lets us do uh, let's let's look at individual household movements. So we know, and you guys are all in this database, by the way, we looked you up. Um, you, we know where you lived last year, and um, and we know if you're about to move and you're you go somewhere else next year, we will know then where you moved. Um, so we can track uh, track that, and not only that, we can track. Uh, we know what income you are. We know some of your demographic characteristics. Um, it's not a perfect data set. Um, it actually took us a year to clean the dar darn thing because um, a lot of people are missing from it. And so you have to then, or, they, or they're in it and then they disappear. So we had to clean out all the faulty cases. And then uh, because we lost some cases, then we had to reweight it to look like the population. So that was a lot of work. So that's the data. The second uh, thing we did was was look at where the climate investments were, and I'll talk more about that in a second. But what we did is we 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 actually digitized uh, all the climate investments that we could identify, um, and we we connected them to the to the neighborhoods they were in, so we could look at impacts locally. Then we did a matched pair analysis, which is a you know classic method in social science to um, compare your treatment areas with your control areas so here we're um, comparing investment neighborhoods with similar neighborhoods um, that are controls uh, that didn't get investments and then we ran our models these were um, household level logistic regression models so we're looking at what's the probability that somebody's going to move out or move in um, at different income levels if certain types of investments happen. So in terms of the investments, we, we uh, so we started out with the CCI database. Um, we augmented it with whatever we could find in the from the MPOs and so forth um, um, and uh, focusing on transit improvements of various kinds, you know, from BRT to electric vehicle infrastructure, um, 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 heavy rail, light rail, et cetera. And then, uh, then we had active transportation and greening investments, um, bike, um, ped improvements, urban greening, greenways, open space, parks, um, data from the parks department and, uh, at the state. Um, we ended up combining those two categories because uh, it wasn't actually enough uh, statistically to look at separately. So that was a little bit of a disappointment. Um, and uh, uh, so all of our results are for those two things combined. Um, and then we, we cleaned out some investments. So we started with something like 1400 investments. We had to clean out uh, a lot of them, um, partly because they, were, they might be things that probably wouldn't have an impact on the neighborhood, like um, replacing an engine in a bus, because there's things like that in the database, but uh, new lights at the transit station. Um, you know, things that expenses that were investments that were less than 100,000 that we didn't think would really spur neighborhood change. So we cleaned out uh, uh, some of these. Um, and then um, the other major thing that we decided um, was not to look at infill development as part of this study. Um, and the reason was uh, there is so much infill development that is uh, going on that's not climate investment related that's not in these databases. So you, it's very hard to isolate, for instance, the impact of the one transit oriented development that was funded by state funds and, and, and isolate that from all the other housing development that's going on in the same neighborhood. Um, so, so in the end, we didn't look at infill development. Um, if you're curious about new market uh, rate construction and the impacts on residential mobility, you can look at the study we released two, two weeks ago, um, which is on our, our website, which talks a lot uh, about uh, those particular impacts. So some examples of the investments that we looked at, obviously transit, um, active transportation trails, um, uh, uh, station improvements, uh, greenways. Um, these are some examples uh, that came up in the regions that we, we looked at. So then we matched 
these uh, investment neighborhoods to control neighborhoods. And so just to orient you to how we're visualizing this, our, um, our investment neighborhoods are always in light green and our controls are in dark green. Um, and so what we did was to find the, 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 the sister, the twin sisters of our investments, um, we matched neighborhoods on several characteristics. So we tried to really focus on uh, demographics that represent um, distressed neighborhoods and disadvantaged neighborhoods, um, and also some other very important kind of urban form characteristics. So we matched on density and distance to the city center. We me measured on education, on race, on poverty, renting, um, and we tried to get as close matches as we could. This is the LA matches. Uh, these are some of the Bay Area matches. Um, these are some of the Sacramento matches. Um, and let me just stick there for a second. Um, one, one issue we had when we were doing this matching is that we had to co consider the possibility that our control tracks, the ones we're matching, had their own investment of some kind. So we had to double check every match um, to make sure it was clean, that it wasn't contaminated, um, that the city, for instance, had not done its own um, uh, park investment um, that was not in the state database. Um, so we wanted to make sure we our controls were, um, were devoid of any kind of climate investment. Um, it's probably not perfect. Um, we, but you know, we spent a year trying to clean these out. Um, we, we had an army of uh, UC Berkeley undergrads cleaning cleaning up these matches for us. Um, so then our modeling approach, we're again looking at the probability that households will move in and out. Uh, we look at different income categories. We try and always match our income categories um, to housing uh, subsidy levels just so that there's practical um, policy implications. And then we look three years before and three years after the project opening. Um, and so th this was um, a period that we felt like we could get enough results, um, but it, um, it would still, we, and we had data for it. So one of the issues we encountered was a lot of the investments were quite recent, they're in 2018, for instance, and we felt like it, uh, our database ended at 2019, and we felt like it was it was not going to be possible to look at these investments and their impact, really understand their impact, because it's still unfolding. Um, so we so we picked investments that where we could study this full period for. Um, and then in all of our analysis, we're looking, so we're looking whether it's a 2000, you know, 2009 investment where we're looking from 2006 to 12 or 2015 investment, we're looking from 2012 to 18. So we're, we're, we throw them all in together uh, into the model. So then we get this uh, fairly uh, robust sample size uh, by looking across time. Um, and so then we, we have a number of different controls for in our models. We control for churn because we, you know, sometimes, sometimes these investments take place in neighborhoods where there's a lot of churn already. Um, so we want to control for that and we want to look at kind of uh, displacement impacts on, on top of that uh, ordinary churn level. Um, and then we controlled for a number of built form and, um, and uh, how, ho home ownership types of characteristics um, and economic characteristics as well. So here's our, I'm gonna just show our overall results from a second. And um, let me try and help orient you to this because we have a number of different charts and, um, and it can get a little confusing. So. So the dark green, again, is the control always. Um, and then the light green is, um, is the climate investment. And this kind of uh, more, more dull green is a transit and the, the brighter green is the active and green investments. So what we're looking at here is out migration rates, um, the, the multi-year average. So this is over six year period, three years before the investment and three years after. Um, and what we're looking at then is the, the percentage of households uh, that are moving out. So if you just for a second look at the very low income households, the dark green is the control neighborhood. So in, in your ordinary neighborhood, you would have a 7.9% 
rate, which means in an average year, you'd have 7.9% of the households would be moving out. Where you had the transit investment or where you had the active transportation or green investment, that increases to 8.4%. So what does that mean? It's an increase of 0.5% of over the three years um, plus um, or, or uh, after or before the project. Um, so if you think about that, was it was 0.5%? If you have a if you have a thousand households in your neighborhood, that's five households um, here. Um, and so in an average year, you'd see five households move out. Over a six year period, you'd see 30 households, very low income households move out. Um, so this was the overall results for when we combined Fresno, Sacramento Bay Area and Los Angeles. Um, and, uh, and you'll see, you'll see there's, there's, uh, there's quite a bit of, of difference here as you go across income groups. Um, but in general, uh, overall, um, we see that particularly for active transportation green improvements, there is a higher out migration rate um, across most income groups, not extremely low, but across most income groups, uh, there is a higher out migration rate. Um, it's, um, however, for, for transit, it's lower out migration rate in our investment neighborhoods. And then uh, we're going to talk. We're going to break this down a little bit by region, so you can see a little bit more detail what what happens in different regions. Um, this this is in migration. So this is the flip side of out migration. This is who got to move in. Um, and uh, here you can see um, uh, again quite a bit of variation by income group. And let's just just let's rest here on the very low income. Uh, folks for a minute, you can see they're on in a control area that the rate is 7.8%. For the transit, it's 8.4. So uh, there's uh, more in migration uh, when there's transit for very low households. Um, there's more in migration for active transportation um, uh, greening improvements um, for very low households, uh, very low income households. Um, the in migration does not happen across all income groups. So if you look at the extremely low, um, on average, there's less in migration for extremely low after these improvements occur. So another way of thinking about this is looking year by year. And this was really of interest to us to understand what could be um, going on, uh, you know, because often there's some sort of anticipatory effect. Everybody knows the park is coming. Everybody knows the train's coming. Um, and do they um, do do they leave the neighborhood or does the landlord, uh, you know, raise the rent in anticipation of the change? Um, so we look before and after here and you can just get a feel for it um, that um, in general, um, it, it varies quite a bit, again, by, by income group. The um, extremely low, generally, uh, the light color, again, are our investment neighborhoods. And in general, um, their out migration is less um, than the controlled areas. Um, for the very low income, it's not, not a happy story of the out migration rates are higher um, with when the investments happen. So they're in the light green for both the transit and for active uh, transportation greening improvements. And then for low income, it's, it's mixed. Uh, transit is um, lower than the control neighborhoods, but active transportation and greening is higher. Then if you start breaking down by region, um, you start to see some, some other interesting effects that kind of deviate from those overall numbers that I just showed you. So uh, uh, this is one of the interesting things we thought that we found um, that, you know, uh, uh, transit improvements could have a different effect in Los Angeles from Sacramento. Um, so, um, so for instance, uh, yeah, on the left of the panel are, is the out migration and in migration um, when transit happens. So just take our very low income group again, um, you have a higher probability of moving out. So you go from 5.4% to 6.2% if you're moving out, if you're very low income. You also have a higher probability of moving in if you're very low income, you go from 5.7 to 6.9%. Um, so I'll let you, I'm not going to go over every single one of these stats. I just, uh, you can go to the report and, and look at all these bar charts, um, but I just uh, wanted to give you a feeling for, for, for these types of findings. 
um, again, uh, looking at Los Angeles over time, before and after, um, very low income in transit uh, has a, a, a significantly more out migration than our control neighborhoods. Um, also low income households and transit. And interestingly, the impact is largely before the transit station opens. Um, so this is a real a red flag because often we think about the displacement that's going to happen after the transit comes, but maybe it's before. And if we had the data, I would have loved to look at six years before, or ten years before, or fifteen years before. Um, we're not able to do that at this time. So uh, Bay Area, uh, as you can see, is quite different. Um, uh, so we have. Um, um, move it, uh, so control and investment neighborhoods have a, a, a bit less difference generally um, uh, for the very low and low income groups than we saw in, in Los Angeles. Um, and, uh, but in general, you're seeing a pattern um, where you have um, slightly higher out migration for, um, for, um, for very low and low income households. Um, and uh, very slightly higher in migrations uh, for, for, those, for those income groups. Um, the Bay Area has a similar kind of anticipatory effect on the transit where the, our investment neighborhoods, again, you have this out migration impact that seems to happen a couple years before the station opens. Um, not so much of an impact for the active transportation and greening, it's at the low income group. And note that throughout all of this, we're just not seeing the same income impacts on the extremely low income households. And we could only really speculate about why this is occurring. We didn't have the right kind of data um, to, to answer the question of, of why extremely low income households might be able to stay, but it could be that they are in subsidized units. Um, it could be that they're in very poor quality housing that um, so they don't uh, get pushed out because it's hard to, it would take a lot of rehab to fix up their places. So that's an area of future research. Um, Fresno, I'm just showing this as a FYI. We, we didn't, uh, we, we do find out migration and in migration impacts of climate investments generally in our Fresno case. We had a hard time getting statistically significant results um, in a lot of our Fresno and Sacramento cases. We just didn't have enough sample size to really say, that much uh, about these two regions. Um, so to sum up here, what we found, um, a summary table. So just to orient you, here we are again, looking at our regions, we're looking at our income groups, um, and we're looking at the direction of the impact. So if there's no plus or minus in the box, that means the impact was not significant. Where there's a plus, it means that there was a, a significant outmigration rate. Um, where there's a minus, it meant that the out-migration rate went down relative to the control neighborhoods. So what you can kind of quickly conclude by a look at this chart is that very low-income groups and low-income groups tend to uh, have higher out-migration rates when there are transit investments, um, but not, not so much for the other groups. And then uh, looking at transportation and greening, um, we see actually even more consistent effects across all the regions and across income groups that you have higher out migration rates relative to the controls um, in all of these regions, except again, Sacramento and Fresno, where we, we just didn't quite have the significance to be able to say. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Julia and then I'll come back with the, with the summation at the end. Yeah, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the case studies and the interactive mapping tool. So we did six case studies and these were conducted. Um, or, so we did interviews for these case studies between September 2020 and December 2021. And we conducted one on one interviews with 61 community stakeholders in the Bay Area, LA and Fresno. And they were conducted by Zoom. They were 30 to 45 minutes and they were semi structured interviews. Um, and as Karen said before, our organizational partners who are wonderful, um, help select the case studies and connect us with interviewees. Next slide. So these are our six case studies. This is a screenshot from our website. 
Um, the first one we did was the Alameda plan for the beautiful way in San Jose. This is basically streetscape improvements. Um, uh, the second one was the extension of the South Line light rail in Sacramento. The third one was looking at the low income weatherization multifamily program, which is statewide. And it's a program that funds energy efficiency upgrades in low income households. The fourth one was um, focused on development along the LA River in previously disinvested areas. The fifth one uh, focused on changes to downtown Fresno, including investments like housing and parks. And then the last one was focused on economic development and neighborhood change along Crenshaw Boulevard in LA. So in the neighborhoods of Crenshaw, Lamert Park, Englewood, and Hyde Park. Next slide. So if you really wanna dig into these case studies, you're welcome to look at our website. Um, but we kind of came up with like three main, three main themes from these. Uh, sort of takeaways about how to um, how organizations are approaching anti-displacement work around these types of investments. So number one is that bottom-up and top-down policymaking need to occur simultaneously. So local organizing or coalition building around anti-displacement policy or community benefits um, builds leadership capacity and puts pressure on the public sector to act. But change occurs the fastest when governments are already putting resources or programs in place. And in some cases, community organizing is spurring the implementation of city or county level strategies. But in, others, uh, in other cases, these processes are happening at the same time and mutually reinforcing each other. So a couple examples um, of this point are the kind of simultaneous. So there's a push for uh, more community ownership model by downtown Crenshaw rising in, in South LA. And um, at the same time, LA County is uh, considering a community land trust pilot program. So these are sort of two, they're sort of the, the grassroots um, organizing work that's happening. And then at the sort of pushing the, the local government to act and kind of formalize uh, the community ownership model through this pilot program. There's also organizing efforts around the LA River that are being met by the park district's formal incorporation of anti-displacement strategies in their work, um, also in LA. There's also in San Jose, the Duradon Area Neighborhood Group um, has done a lot of uh, activism and organizing work. And uh, that work has found support via the city's citywide residential anti-displacement strategy. So all these things kind of happening in tandem. Uh, our second big takeaway was that organized efforts to resist private development, as well as incorporation into formal government policymaking processes play a critical role in increasing community, ca uh, community capacity. So a couple of examples in Fresno, um, community members and activists have uh, taken formal roles in the city's anti-displacement task force and Transform Fresno has also bolstered community capacity. In LA, um, LA Metro formed something called the Community, Le community Leadership Council and that was related to the Crenshaw LAX line. In San Jose, there's a community steering committee that has helped shape the Alameda plan for the beautiful way. Um, and in all these cases, new leadership emerged, which then helped the community engage in a more sophisticated discussion about climate investment and anti-displacement policy and really become um, part of the process in a more formal way. And then number three, uh, education about climate investments, anti-displacement policies, and tenants' rights will help define consensus-based based approaches. Um, so some examples for this are in LA, uh, there was something called TOD or Transit Oriented Development University which educated um, residents about light rail in West LA. Uh, there's also numerous organizations, community organizations that have published recommendations for addressing green gentrification and affordable housing needs around the LA River. And then in Fresno, there was the publication of the Displacement Avoidance Plan, which helped provide a, a framework for future organizing around climate investments. Next slide. So I'm also gonna talk about the interactive mapping tool that I created um, with the help of, like Karen said, an army of undergrads who digitized all of these investments and put them on a map. Um, so we created this tool to provide policymakers, activists, and others with a visual illustration of the spatial relationship between climate investments and migration patterns in their communities. So to create the tool, we used um, shiny and leaflet packages in R, um, and we basically mapped all of the investments in the climate investment database and we also included the urban infill projects that were excluded from the quantitative analysis because we had already digitized them. So we thought it'd be best to show them. Um, 
So the map, as you can see, I have a little screenshot here and this tool is available. It's right at the top of our website, um, which Montre just uh, put a link in the... Um, oh, yeah, I, I was looking there. for oh. the link. I oh. apologize, I was looking for the link. That's but right. if he's got it, um, <laughs> that's great. Yes, so you can look at the tool in that link. It's at the top of our, of our page for this project. Um, so as you can see in the screenshot, the map shows in, in green, it's all of the investments that were in the climate investment database, as well as a pop-up that, um, that shows the name of the project, when, the, when construction started, when the um, project basically opened, um, cost, the program that funded the investment and some other information. Um, you can also see the, so the color of the yellow and blue, that is migration data by census track. Um, and so basically how this works is you can toggle the filters. You can't see all the filters on the left here, but you can basically toggle them to see whether, um, you can basically see this migration data for either renters or both renters and owners. You can look at net in migration, in migration or out migration rates. Um, you can also uh, toggle the time period. So we have the entire time period and then a couple different kind of year chunks. So let's say an investment happened in like 2012, you could set it, the migration data to 2011 to 2014. If you wanna kind of see like, okay, what was going on migration wise around that time when it was actually opened. Um, and then you can also look at different income groups. So you can kind of see on the bottom left there, there's, we have all those five different income categories. So the migration data, um, is showing only migration data for that particular income group. Um, and then also, you can't see this in the screenshot, but we also, um, uh, Karen mentioned our other study that looks at market rate and subsidized housing construction. And we have like little bubbles that are a different color, also by census tract that show the number of those type of units that were built during the time period selected. Um, yeah, Karen, I give it back to you. Great. Okay, um, so I'm just gonna wrap it up and I'm looking forward to discussion. Um, so what we found here was that clearly climate investments do have unintended consequences, uh, but these consequences, at least in terms of household mobility are quite small and they are quite contextually specific. Um, so that's sort of a, a good news and a hard news story. I mean, the good news is that these impacts are probably mitigable, um, at least partially mitigable. Um, but the issue is that we don't really have a scientific number, a magic number to give each project and say, this is how many affordable housing units you need to preserve or how many, uh, how much you need to build for this income group, because the impacts are going to vary depending on the region, but depending on the type of investment, depending on the income group you're talking about, and even the project. And so, and and this, you know, insight came partly from our data, but it also came from talking to our partners. And so, for instance, you know, when we're finding our LA findings and our um, LA partner, Public Council, Shashi Hanuman says, said to us, you know, I, I'm pretty sure that, you know, the Expo line project had, had more impacts than you're finding for, for the county of Los Angeles overall. And she was right, you know, when we dug into the data, there's, there's, there were some uh, other impacts. Um, so, um, so, so just the variation is going to be, it is extreme, and it's really going to depend on the, on the local community context. And that, in the end, along with the case studies, um, made us realize that, you know, rather than kind of prescribing, you need to have this type of policy in this type of neighborhood, the, the real approach here to mitigation is community engagement, which is why we went into these uh, case studies to really find out the different ways the communities were engaging, because it, it, it's going to depend on, on the local community what type of mitigation is appropriate. Um, and for whom, and, uh, and properly those conversations should be led by communities. Um, I do believe that uh, you know, from this research and our other research on um, market rate development impacts, 
that there is an impact. There's the, you, you, we know already that there is an impact. We know already that we need to mitigate. Um, and so this should be just like any other thing you mitigate with a project. If you're going to mitigate your traffic signal light timings because of your level of service uh, or your parking availability, you know, mitigate your, your displacement impacts. It should be just automatic. Uh, you're going to do some mitigation. You don't have to, you don't have to stop everything um, and, and, you know, freeze time, um, but you do have to have to mitigate. Um, one of the things that we thought about as we were talking to community groups was, you know, how should we mitigate? And that's this last bullet point. Um, I, I would really push for doing um, more housing preservation of, of the unsubsidized affordable units that um, are going to um, experience uh, flipping and rent increases um, as the improvements come in. So how can we think about buying those buildings and keeping them in affordability and in perpetuity? Um, uh, and then I think community land trusts are a unique opportunity with California's climate investment program because, um, because you're making investments, you're often acquiring land or you're using public land um, and, and we should be thinking about then how to use some of that uh, public land uh, to, to uh, build new uh, affordable housing or create different uh, forms of, of uh, shared equity housing, um, community land trusts and so forth. Um, so great opportunity. Um, and I hope that the state uh, moves forward on our recommendations here. So uh, with that, I think I'll just stop sharing and open it up for discussion. Oh, and I just, yeah, quite, quite, any questions would be great. Um, I wanted to acknowledge that Sam uh, tefferman Galfin did make it, is he still here? So I just wanted to say he's our partner from Public Advocates and, um, was really, uh, hi Sam, was really uh, crucial in helping us think through some really tricky methodological issues. So really grateful 